Can you believe this? We're, we're a couple weeks after the uh, Boston bombing. What are the articles talking about? Is it a lone wolf? Is it a conspiracy? People are saying they wished it was a, a white guy, somebody else. They say they, it's domestic terrorism. You know, it just occurs to me that everybody talks about what they want it to be, so they don't have to talk about what it may well be. A couple years ago, in June 2010, I was asked to brief a couple members of Congress about what this concept of the lone wolf was. It's the first time I brought up the fact that what, what our FBI and DHS calls lone wolf is actually a formal part of jihad. Now, I'm going to go into an explanation of what this is, starting with those brief, and try to use slides that I have used in other briefings to show that there's historical, there's precedent to this, not just in terms of that we've known this, but that it has been briefed. Because as we are listening to these people come up with these theories for political reasons or for it fits their academic background, sociologists want to talk about a sociological impact on terrorism, political scientists this, I think that we run the risk of of missing what is going to become a serious national security threat and also a threat that's going to get Americans killed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a brief, the lone wolf terrorism versus individual jihad, and I want to ask you if you feel that when you hear people talk about these other things, whether it's even appropriate. Because it seems to me that there has to be an element of reality dislocation. Now. Because this is about just explaining this concept, I am, I'm going to try to tie this into briefings I've already given that you can go onto the Intel Standards webpage at CSP and look at the briefs that explain the full concepts. But when I get to a point where I hit that mark, I'm just going to say, and this is what launched that. So you can get the details there later. But I also want to, um, and I want to keep this pretty quick and, and, and move it along. So with that, we're going to start this. So. What, am I, what is my great concern? My great concern is we have seen t articles like this. We've heard it. Experts blame right-wing theorists for Boston Marathon. Have you noticed that every time something bad happens, you see the entire media start building up the groundswell for something like that, almost like it's a policy to do that. But it's a policy to generate narratives in the absence of facts. And what they're doing is it seems to me they're just playing a random game that at one every, once every so often one will pop up their way and then they can run with the ball. But what it means is that they have put political considerations or ideological considerations ahead of briefing the fact of the matter. And this is getting to be really, I think, a problem. We've seen investigators favor domestic, a theory, a domestic theory. We even have Salon hoping that the person who did this act was a white guy. Well, you know what? If it was a white guy that did that, I would hope that they would find him. And I would hope they'd run him down like they ran these people down. But I hope they do it no matter who it is. And one of the best ways to keep this from happening and to catch these guys is to chase them based on who they are when there's a reasonably good understanding that we can understand who they are. So terror experts, the Boston attack more like Columbine and 9-11. These are murderers, not terrorists. Really? So, and finally, brainwashing. I would like to point something out to you. When you listen to official reports on terrorism, or something having to do with terrorism, or, or media reports about terrorism, I want you to understand them. First, the, 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 when you hear people say that people are crazy or they're unbalanced, you know what that means? It means they've given themselves permission to think about this as some kind of idiosyncratic act that requires no deep dive and they give themselves permission to not do anything, except say, well, that guy's crazy. What's the point of finding why he acted? You know, how many people have to die for the same reason before we understand that that doesn't cut it, and we don't spend tens of billions of dollars in law enforcement and intelligence to have someone tell us, hey, the guy's crazy, what's the point? Because I could do that. I mean, anybody could do that. So at what point also does this start to just constitute a cultural level disinformation? That they want to color the discussion of what's happening ahead of events. So this is really important. Back a number of years, I met uh, Dr. Boston when he was writing a book, The Legacy of Jihad. And he shared with me a document that he actually found buried, I think, at the State Department. It was the last fatwa from a sitting caliph calling for a global jihad. And of course, it was during World War I. 
And it's very interesting because it came from the seat of the caliphate and it ordered global jihad against all non-Muslims. And because it's the caliphate, he did have the authority to do so. I've had people tell me, well, Steve, it didn't work. Well, a lot of things don't work. We're not interested in whether it worked. We're interested in whether such a, such a claim could be made. It can. And whether such a, such a, what you call, could be given, it was. And you know what? Because he ordered global jihad, here we're going to take a little take out of this book, The Seat of the Caliphate. We're going to, we're going to see how the caliphate talks about this concept of jihad, the forms of jihad, and the very first one they talk about is individual jihad. Now, before I go read, I, I'm going to say here is a term of art, because it's going to look like a generic term, and I'll say term of art, because you'll say that's just a normal term, because it will come up later, and you'll see, okay? The jihad may be of three forms. The first is individual jihad, and it consists of the individual personal deed, and it may be by the use of cutting, killing instruments like the jihad of, and it goes off and explains it. The killing, the killing of one of the officials arriving from Mecca by Abu Busir in the age of the prophet is an example given. So first the, caliph, the caliphate is saying that this concept of individual jihad can be traced back to the time of the prophet. It then gives an in example where the Prophet Muhammad himself ordered such an event. This is extremely important because that makes this a formal part of jihad. When the Prophet commanded Abdullah, the son of Adak, that he and his four companions should go and kill Abi Rafi, the chief of the Jews of Kaibar, well known for his enmity toward Islam. And then finally, to put this in context, World War II, and kill, and kill one of those who belonged to the Triple Entente, of the infidels who are known for their hostility to Islam. What was going on? The Ottoman Turks were fighting in World War I, and they were in major battle with the British. The British were pe bringing people from their Indian holdings to go fight in, the, in Asia Minor in the Battle of Gallipoli, among other things. And if, he, if, the, if the caliphate could cause an uprising in India, it would force the British to have to divert troops. So this was a serious undertaking didn't succeed. But, so now we have a form of individual jihad. Now I'd like to think Major Hassan, the man who threw the grenade into the tent of the army, uh, uh, Malvo, the DC sniper. Actually, I think we could come up with a list of 10 people since 9-11 that we could say fits that category, but I've just given you a couple. And guess what? I think we could put the Boston Marathon in that category or the next form of jihad we're going to get to, which is very close and similar to it. But isn't that something? Somebody could decide they've heard this requirement to fight jihad individually, or they heard the requirement to fight jihad and they decided to do it individually. They could find it's a form of jihad, and then they decide to act. What warning? You know, is it a lone jihad? No, that's a jihadi, and it's individual jihad. Is there a conspiracy? Well, you know what? It may well be that that guy got a friend and then went to a very radical mosque to get some help to do something. But I want you to understand, that's not required. What's required is that he heard the requirement to fight into uh, jihad that he interpreted to be an individual act and he was required to act. So I want you to notice that that discussion is, is it lone wolf, a made up term, so we don't call it what we all know it is, jihad, an individual actor, or conspiracy. And we have a box on each side. And if it doesn't fit in one of those boxes, well, what can it be? Well, I'm going to keep showing you that we, act, if we follow the evidence and the published strategy and doctrine and game plan of Al-Qaeda, we should have known the second we heard that it was a pressure cooker. OK? Of course somebody else could have done this. But let me give you the, the uh, fantasy here that it was a right-wing extremist who did this, then one of the things we could have said about that right-wing extremist was he was an agent provocateur because he did it in exactly the way al-Qaeda said they wanted it done. What I'm saying here is not only is that domestic terrorism, lone wolf to be anything else, not only is it not correct, it is in fact masking clear evidence based on published doctrine and announced uh, uh, announcements of where they plan to go. So with that, we'll keep going. By the way, can you plan against a lone terrorist who might just decide today that he's going to be a terrorist tomorrow? 
Now that's extreme. But what do you do to defend against that? So the other form of jihad we're going to look at here is jihad by bands. It may be described as jihad by bands known in our time as brigands. Well, remember, when Muhammad first started fighting jihads, they would sit outside the city and raid the caravans. It was economic warfare. So that because it was jihad and the cause of Allah, it was jihad. But if somebody was to do that same thing, and it wasn't jihad and the cause of Allah, it would be highway robbery. And it is enough for the prophet that the jihad by bands, it was enough, and it is enough for you to know that the prophet began the jihad by bands when permission was given for him for the killing in the words of Allah Most High, and it quotes the Quran. So, the formation, the formation of bands in our time is of different kinds, and the most profitable of them is that which makes use of secret formations, term of art, and it is hoped that the Islamic world of today will profit very greatly from secret bands, term of art. These formations may take the oath of excess in which the prophet participated before sending them out originally. So here we have this concept of jihad that includes this idea of individual jihad or small, small group activities. So let's kick forward to June 2010. Al-Qaeda comes out with their first magazine. And you know what? Al-Qaeda's magazine wasn't written in Arabic. It wasn't written in Farsi. It wasn't written in Pashtun. It was written in English. Inspire magazine. And here you have it. And what did they do? What did they do? They basically announced that their magazine, written in English, the Islamic magazine is geared toward the making of a Muslim mujahid, that's the actual term for jihadi, a person who fights jihad, in Allah's path. Our intent is to give the most accurate presentation of Islam as followed by the Salaf al-Sali. Our concern for the Ummah is worldwide. So here you see that there's a change in scope. There's actually going to be here a change of mission because their goal is the entire Islamic, the Salafi movement. So you go, you go advance into, the, into this first edition and you find the Jihadi Experience, an article written by al-Suri. Now, you know, when you read what we write about al-Suri, well, they always say something like, Suri, a propagandist, an ideologue. You know, al-Suri is their chief strategist. And, you know, we really should take him serious, because if we understood him as a chief strategist, we'd understand this article is laying out al-Qaeda's plan for how they're going to fight us. And then we would actually maybe take proactive measures. So what did he say in this what did he say in this article, al sorry Our secret organizations, term of art, remember, that we could take back to the caliphate. Our secret organizations were militarily defeated in all the confrontations. Yes, we won many of the battles, but we lost the war and all the jihadi experience and confrontations. Because that was true, the times have changed, he said, and we must design a method of confrontation which is in accordance with the standards of the present time. So al sori is basically opening right up in their first edition and saying, guess what? We're changing our strategy. Now, that's not saying they're going to they're gonna dump large-scale jihadi acts of terrorism. They're saying they need to change their main emphasis. So we just have a change of scope. Now we have a change of mission. And you see this. They give three types of jihad. The first one they ruled out, the School of Secret Organizations. Okay that now we know is an actual term of art. They also talked about the school of open fronts and op overt confrontation. They know they're not up to that yet. And then they came to their third option, individual jihad and small cell terrorism. So now we're seeing, if you read the next couple editions of Inspire magazine, you would see that what al Sori was doing was building the game plan to say, this is where al Qaeda is going, and this is what we're going to do. So, we have Islamic doctrine. There is such a thing as jihad that means warfare, and individual jihad is a part of that that goes back to the very beginning and is recognized as such. And now we have Al-Qaeda saying there's, that's where they're going. So, every one of those people writing those articles saying, it hey, looks like it might be uh, homegrown terrorism, or our national security, law enforcement, or intelligence people saying the same thing, I would like to point out that you have been on formal notice by al-Qaeda 
in English that this is a change in strategy and this is how they're coming at you. And I would like to suggest that's exactly what they did in Boston. It's exactly what Major Hassan did. It's exactly what um, the DC sniper did. And like I said, I think we could easily get a list of 10 others inside the United States since 9-11. So, <clears throat> you know, if you kept reading that first edition of Inspire, you would find out that there was a little recipe book in there. It was how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, the Al-Qaeda chef. That was on page 33. And if you got to page 40, what you found is how to make a pressure cooker bomb. You see where I'm going here? If we were just to ask the question, who is out there that thinks that pressure cooker bombs are really cool, we would have instantly, had we been doing our work, remember DHS says Al-Qaeda is one of the greatest threats. So DHS should have instantly zeroed in on this. And yet clearly, they were looking for anybody but this. So pressure cooker bomb. So I want to point something out because as we look at what happened with this Al-Qaeda doctrine, I'd like to point out that as we look at that, we're also seeing that the Islamic Society of Boston also played a role. So we're going to do a couple reviews of Muslim Brotherhood stuff just to see how we could bring in some of that relationship. And I will apologize if a couple places I go a little bit into the weeds. So, but what does it say here? Some of them believe we are on the Meccan stage and have therefore set for themselves programs that are limited according to the rules of Mecca. Now, if you go into my briefing that we have online at CSP on abrogation, you will understand there is the period of revelation that was the Meccan period. It was followed by the Medinan period, and in Medina is when they fought wars. So what Al-Qaeda was telling their friends, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, is you guys are stuck in Mecca, it's time to go to Medina. It's time to go to war. And they're clearly announcing it. But you know, I didn't have, I, when I first saw that, you saw at the time, even Yusuf al Khalidari, the chief jurist of the Muslim Brotherhood, basically talking about laying low because they were having some blowback in Europe. So it was very interesting as we saw events uh, uh, evolve that they were telling them to get with the program, and I was thinking, well, are they going to start separating? Because after a while, they were looking like they were start getting, start to get along. And lo and behold, in early October, we read about a speech that the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, for, the formal head, uh, Badi, Muhammad Badi, uh, gave a speech where he said, he called on Muslim, the Muslim nation to unite against the enemies who are plotting against Islam. It's very interesting. This is Ikhwan Webb. And it says right there, it's the official English language website. And I have had people come up to me and say, Steve, where'd you find that? And I said, I got it on the Muslim Brotherhood's webpage. She said, where'd you find that? On the web. How do you know it's theirs? Because they say it's their official website. So my point is, they basically declared a level of, they basically declared in their English language website a declaration of hostility that when you went and read the actual one in Arabic was actually much more clear. But here, in, in, on October 5th, 2010, they were telling us, Badi said from his speech, which he gave in late September, from the Islamic point of view, the relationship between the Muslim and non-Muslim countries should be balanced, and if Muslims faithfully implemented the constitution of Allah, they will be victorious. If they fail to do so, corruption and injustice will prevail among them. So what is he telling them? They need to move forward and do what? Implement Islamic law. And if they don't, they're going to fall apart. And then he said, he pointed out that the Muslims need to realize the means of power and understand that the cha uh, that change and, and reform cannot be achieved without the ultimate sacrifice. What is the ultimate sacrifice in the Islamic world? Jihad. And you get killed. You become a shaheed. So this is clearly a call for jihad. It's very interesting because... Inspire comes out in June and, and late September, and reporting in English in early October, you see that the Muslim Brotherhood just flipped. That's when we started to say, you know what? We think that the entire world, the Islamic world, is starting to converge on the point, on a single point. And this is what started what became known as my timeline brief, which yet again you can go and see on, online. The timeline brief where we called starting in October, 
the total collapse of the Arab states to Mus the Muslim Brotherhood and other entities, well, including Al-Qaeda influences within the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, did we put the Muslim Brotherhood in power in Libya, or did we put Al-Qaeda in power in Libya? I mean, that's the question we have to ask. So here we have it. That was extreme. What it also means is Al-Qaeda called this, and we saw it happen. Something is afoot. So now we kick to the winter 2012 uh, Inspire magazine, and Al Sori comes up with yet another article. And what does he say? He says, well, go after the stock exchange, kill the military and stuff like that. But he also said we should go after some other things. For example, go after media personalities and media centers, uh, places where Jews are gathered, their leading personalities and institutions in Europe, avoiding, however, synagogues. I think they've gotten some very bad blowback by going after synagogues. So the type of attack they went on to say, which repels and topples governments, is mass slaughter of the population. Targeting human crowds in order to inflict maximum human losses is the goal. This is very easy since there are numerous such targets, such as crowded sports arenas, annual social events, large international exhibitions, crowded marketplaces, skyscrapers, and crowded buildings. So he goes on and says, the confrontation with America is fundamental, while the confrontation with Europe is secondary, aimed at making Europe leave the alliance by putting pressure on her. Then the final two points, one is to basically point out you shouldn't go attack churches or synagogues. You can attack them, but you can attack the people in them, but not at the church or synagogue. I actually think that that's because that causes a major rupture with who? Their inner faith partners in the Jewish and Christian community who are trying to pretend that they're affecting some positive outcome. So, and finally, and this becomes very interesting, one should avoid harming civilians who are citizens of countries that, are, that have no relation with the conflict, even if they are non-Muslims. This must be done in order to maintain the re reputation of the resistance in the different spheres of public opinion. Why is this important? Because on one of these things they say attack large sporting events, and the Boston Marathon was a large sporting event. But you know what? Had they bombed the, 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 the Boston Marathon when the, the biggest group of championship runners were there, those would have been the world-class runners and world-class and people who attended the world-class part of it. Those people were not killed. So it looks to me like they're, they're hitting two points on Al-Sori's on, on list. They waited until it was you know, American and regional runners in the main and the people who were going to crowd around that. Very interesting. So we have conformance there. Because if it was something else, if it was a right-wing survivalist or something like that, they would have blown it up at the finish line when the, everybody was coming and all the media was there. So I think there's purpose here. So now here is the spring 2013 edition of Inspire. Of course, this is a special edition. So this is on the inside leaf because it's a special edition. Here's the... Here's that edition. It's called the Lone Mujahid Pocketbook. Well, as I said earlier, the real word for jihadi is actually mujahid. And they're playing on the fact that we use lone wolf, so they said lone mujahid instead of individual jihad. But you see that. Did anybody see in the news recently that they found six other explosive devices that they were using in Times Square? Take a look at the city the, the nightscape here, and what do you see? Times Square. Times Square was the next target. So all I'm pointing out here, and this is Al-Qaeda specifically targeting high, high interest American targets. They hit, they hit Boston Marathon. They're, they're telling you here they have the objective of also going after Times Square, which our own law enforcement said they were planning to do. So here we have this. Maybe the uh, bombers up in Boston saw this cover and decided that was going to be their target. It's certainly on the task list. So I just want to point out that a whole lot of the talk we have about Al-Qaeda and what they're not doing, we're not hearing that. And what are we hearing? I mean, I have heard 
when I was in the intelligence community, when I was out of the, oh, they're on the ropes, oh, they're back, oh, they're on the ropes. And I, at a certain point, you realize this has nothing to do with who they are. It's about what we're not able to follow. So I just kind of want to show you this Der Spiegel article that came out in 2005 that reported on activities uh, and meetings someone had with a, a, a Al Qaeda operative, and I think in 2001, 2003, where they were laying down the timeline for Al Qaeda. Because are they on the ropes? Because it's going to seem to me that for a group that's on the ropes, they seem to have their stuff. They seem to be online with what they want to do. They said phase four, which would have been eight years in advance, the year 2010 to 2013, is when the Arab states would be taken down. And that 2013 would be the year where they start to implement the caliphate. And the 2000, and, and, and 2016 would be when they'd start to go to total confrontation. I am amazed that this period of taking down the Arab states happened in exactly the phase they charted out. But that means that right now they're looking to implement the, the caliphate. And what would that be? It would be the OIC. So I just want, when you hear people hearing about how they're on the ropes, I think the question is, gosh, for a group that's on the ropes, they sure seem to be on their game plan. And I think that after you have the first couple beers with something coming from Afghanistan, you'll get to understand we sure don't think we are. So... Let's take a look at that explanatory memorandum. It's a quick review, but we want to bring it into play because we want to see how the Muslim Brotherhood influences this picture. The explanatory memorandum was written in 1991 by the Muslim Brotherhood of America, and it states their objectives and what they plan to do. And of course, they say they are the Islamic movement, the, 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 it's the Islamic movement that the Muslim Brotherhood is running. There's their logo. Very interesting. I had a friend take a look at this. They pointed this out to me. That if you look at the if you look at the um, explanatory memorandum, the point I'm getting to here is this concept of convergence. I think we're getting to a point where we're seeing these organizations converge, and I mean seriously converge. I mean when Egypt, the government of Egypt, is governed by the Muslim Brotherhood, could bring a known terrorist into the United States to meet with the president. What separates that from Al Qaeda? I mean, think about that. But here we have it, we have this language here, and right here we have the discussion about the observant Muslim base. Well, that is actually Al-Qaeda, okay? I just want to point that out. So this language actually was appearing in the explanatory memorandum and it didn't get picked up. So, by the way, you've seen this before. You see the, the Muslim Brotherhood logo here, and that's what it says right there. That's the Arabic, and of course it means against them make ready. Against them make ready what? Well, that happens to be the lead in verse to verse 860 that says, uh, of the Quran, which says, against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war to strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others besides who you do not know, but who Allah doth know. So look at this. That's clearly a jihadi uh, a verse of the Quran, and it's clearly somewhat oriented to a preparing as much as fighting. And isn't that the Muslim Brotherhood's role? But you know, going back to this concept of convergence, look at this, and prepare against them to the utmost of your power. This appeared where? It appeared in the lone Mujahid pocketbook, right there. So, do you see this? Al-Qaeda is now using the Muslim Brotherhood's logo as their own. I just think that this is an indicative of something. So, and by the way, if you go look at that, they reprised the need to make pressure cooker bombs. So, a pressure cooker bomb goes off at the Boston Marathon, or some of them do, and in that same season, Al-Qaeda publishes their book saying that's what you got to do. So here are those list of players. I just want to rem remind you, Isna was on the list of that explanatory memorandum, Muslim Student Association, North American Islamic Trust. Back then it was the ISNA Fiqh Committee, today it's the Fiqh Council of North America. Then Islamic Association of Palestine, their leaders created a unit, an element called CARE, and their leadership transferred over. Uh, then you have ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, and the International Institute of Islamic Thought, and many more. So what does that document say? That document says, what does the explanatory memorandum say? It says, and what does it mean? Enablement of Islam in North America, meaning establishing an effective and stable Islamic movement led by the Muslim Brotherhood, which adopts Muslim 
causes domestically and globally and supports the global Islamic state wherever it is. Well, that's their motto. It seems pretty clear to me. And more importantly, to go to the, the, the main points on this explanatory memorandum that should people, on, should people on notice is the movement must plan and struggle to obtain the keys and the tools of this process in carrying out this grand mission is as a civilization jihadist responsibility which lies on the shoulders of Muslims and on top of them the Muslim Brotherhood in this country. So do you see this? They are flat out telling you that the Muslim Brotherhood's mission is to bring civilization jihad here and that they are the executors of that mission in this country. We need to keep that in mind again as we talk about this Al-Qaeda activity from the Al-Qaeda playbook at the same time we're picking up that the Islamic Society of Boston seems to be where they were radicalized. Now finally the most important quote, understanding the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America the first line is very important. It says, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. When you're reading Muslim Brotherhood material or things that emanate around it, when you hear by itself that they're here to settle, their goal is settlement, you need to know that they mean jihad. How do you know? Because I'm telling you they just defined it right here. The process of settlement is the civilization jihadist process with all that it means. And they go on and give us a taste of it. The Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. So, how do they plan to win the civilization jihad? Well, among other things, they plan to win it by getting us to defeat ourselves. Maybe by having our elite media and our elite law enforcement and elite st strategic thinkers orient all their thinking on abstractions or ideological preferences in light of the fact of published, a published game plan which we just saw executed. Maybe that's civilization jihad. And also, going after people who would point out that what we just saw was right out of somebody's game plan. It works for me. So the reason we're going into this explanatory memorandum is not just to point out the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, according to their own strategic document, but that they have a paragraph 17 that talks about the role of, of their centers, mosques under the control of the Muslim Brotherhood, which they do not call mosques. They do, but they don't. They call either Islamic centers or Islamic societies of. So what does paragraph 17 say? Understanding the role and the nature of the work of the Islamic center in every city with what achieves the goal of the process of settlement. So what did they just say here? An Islamic center in every city is there to achieve the goal of the process of settlement, which means that every Muslim Brotherhood controlled mosque is here to engage in civilization jihad. It goes on, this is, a, this is the order for the Islamic Center to turn an action not in words into a seed for a small Islamic society. The larger one would be the Islamic Society in North America. So I just want you to pick up on this language. It's important. So if you see a entity it's called the Islamic center of something or the Islamic society of something, you're, you're on notice that there is the overwhelming probability you're looking at a facility that's under the positive control and ownership of the Muslim Brotherhood. And you're therefore under a, for, a positive a, a warning that their goal is the process of settlement which they define as civilization jihad with everything it means. Let's go on and look at some other parts of that paragraph after we kind of go through here. I just noticed here, I got ahead of myself, that of course, ISNA, the Islamic Society in North America, is an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation trial. So, going back to that paragraph 17, we actually point out that the process of settlement is civilization jihad, but we also want to point out that it tells you the center we seek is the one which constitutes the axis of our movement the perimeter, the circle of our work, the balance center, the base 
for our rise and our dar al arkam to educate us prepare and supply our battalions the word in arabic was falange now this is important because people will say steve they could have been speaking figuratively well that's possibly true however this is a book that says it's their strategic plan this is their document that says this is their strategic plan where they say their goal is jihad that includes warfare or suggests warfare with all of its form and it uses the word supply our battalions we can we should al allocate analytical time to think about the metaphorical meaning but we better get down the actual meaning because that's the one that constitutes a threat to the american people and to the uh, the, the national security of the united states it goes on and it says the islamic center would turn into a place for family study battalion course seminars vi uh, visit sports school social club women's gathering kindergartens for male and females if you take out the word battalion it seems like this is what almost all the islamic centers say there are is their mission if you go back and do a google on the ground zero mosque it seems that this is kind of what uh, imam rauf was saying for the ground zero mosque so it seems like that's standard language. The meaning of the center's role should be the same as the mosque's role during the time of God's prophet, God's prayer and peace be on him when he marched to settle the Dawah in the first generation of Medina from, from the mosque. This is very important. A Muslim Brotherhood mosque, an Islamic center or an Islamic society of it is a mosque that is the type of mosque that Muhammad used when he was settling, waging jihad in furtherance of the Dawah mission in Medina. So they're flat out saying that. You have to make a decision to analyze what they mean by what's intended to be meant when you use their narrative. Very clear. So mosques in the first generation were used to stage jihad. So when you see something with the terms Islamic Center or Islamic society, you should really be thinking in terms of the fact that it's a Muslim Brotherhood brand. And as a brand, it would be managed as such. So as we keep going, why am I bringing this up? Because, of course, it turned out that the terrorists who bombed the uh, marathon had ties, or at least some of them had, one of them had ties to the Islamic society of Boston. And it has, an, uh, it has a reputation for being pretty radical. And here we look at their uh, uh, articles of organization. Who founded, who founded the ISB? Uh, Alamudi. Now, Alamudi is very famous because he founded many Muslim Brotherhood front entities, and he was the leader of many. In fact, he actually created the Department of Defense's chaplain program. That's right, Alamudi, a Muslim brother. But he's most famous for the fact that he's now serving uh, long term in prison for his role as an al-Qaeda operative in an attempted assassination of a foreign dignitary. That's right, an al-Qaeda operative. Think about it. An al-Qaeda operative creates our chaplain program for the Department of Defense. I think about that. So now what I find interesting is when Alamudi was good Alamudi, he was in charge of all these Muslim Brotherhood organizations that nobody cared about. But when he's bad Alamudi, he is an al-Qaeda operative. You know, we have precedent for that. Because when Anwar al awaki was going to the Pentagon and talking to our seniors, or when he was giving his Juma prayers on Friday inside the national capital, he was a moderate, a member of CARE, I do believe, or Muslim Student Association. But when we realized that he wasn't the nice guy and the, the pinnacle of outreach, he became al-Qaeda. Now, I'm bringing this up in terms of we want to draw this hard line between Muslim Brotherhood and the front groups in this country and Al-Qaeda. Yet clearly, we have been disappointed by maintaining that hard line. And why are we putting a hard line where clearly that line is blurred? And in fact, clearly, it just goes from shades of darker gray to lighter gray. We're not even going to black and white. So just something to think about. So. There's also the idea that there's the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center, and it is under the control of the Muslim, Muslim American Society, in fact, the Muslim American Society of Boston. But that means 
that as the Muslim, American, the Muslim American society, they merged with the Islamic center of North America, ICNA. So we can take some of the things they say when they use terms and apply the terms maybe ICNA uses when they use those terms. We'll take a look. But most importantly, in 2002, in Muslim American Society's own magazine, the, the American Muslim, in the June 2002 edition, they published the fatwa saying it is, it's okay to undertake suicide jihad. On the other hand, they published in the martyr operation, the Muslim sacrifices his own life for the sake of performing a religious duty, which is jihad against the enemy, as scholars say. Totally validated it. So this organization is the one that has control over, for example, the Islamic Society of Boston's Cultural Center. So incidentally, let me just say, the chief jurist of the Muslim Brotherhood, Yusuf Kawadari, is the person who had the fatwa in 2004 calling for the killing of all Americans in Iraq, that all Americans were combatants. i just like to point that out. But because the Muslim American society, because the Muslim American society merged with uh, ICNA, and ICNA put out the, book, the document on methodology of Dawah, I think it's really important to point out that when we look at the methodology of Dawah, outreach, they basically, let's just leave it with the dedication page, because you can look at my other briefs to see what, this, what detail this goes into. I think it's enough to point out that Siddiqui dedicated his book to the uh, Da'i and Alaha who are struggling and waiting to lay down their lives for establishing God's kingdom on earth. What, what do we need to point out? Well, if you get the book, or if you want to read the Quran quote underneath, it's actually more explicit. So now we're going to take a look at a letter dated October 19, 2011 to the Honorable John Brennan, who was still in the White House at the time. He was the, um, he was the uh, assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism and a Deputy National Security Advisor. And the letter was signed by many known groups who are affiliated with Muslim Brotherhood Front Groups, ISNA, CARE, ICNA, MPAC, and it was CC'd to other members. And what did they do? They demanded, among other things, that all training be uh, reviewed, that there be a purge of all federal government training material that is biased, to, to undertaken to ensure that personnel review, uh, that personal reviews are conducted, and all trainers and other government employees who promoted bias training and tra uh, training materials are effectively di disciplined, and to issue guidelines that clearly stating that religious practices and political advocacy are protected activities under the First Amendment and not indicators of violence. Well, this is just nonsense. So this is the Muslim Brotherhood demanding that our counterterrorism uh, czar require that all people do terrorism analysis without respect to the, the uh, Al-Qaeda's professed doctrine. What is the bias? Well, I'd like to put this a different way. If the Muslim Brotherhood is saying that factual analysis is biased because it actually identifies them as hostile, and our government enforces that standard, then the government is suppressing facts that are relevant to the understanding and the nature of terrorists who are actually a national security threat and a threat to the people of this country. That's an extreme demand. I also like to point out that this is very Soviet-esque, a purge, retraining. So I think we really need to think about that because bias can never be the suppression of facts because you, you follow the evidence where it goes. So what's very interesting is that letter, that demand was written on the 19th of October, and on the 3rd of November of the same year, Mr. Brennan responded. And the person he wrote this letter to was uh, Mrs. Kara. And of course, she is, she's someone who runs Muslim Advocates. And you will know her even better by the fact that she had a run-in when she was testifying before the Senate, uh, where Senator Kyle asked her flat out why her organization was telling Muslims not to talk to law enforcement. Why she was telling Muslims that they should only talk to law enforcement with an attorney. Now, I'm not saying that when they were when they were suspects in a case, she was saying, 
always, that they should always talk to law enforcement with an attorney, even if it was to give information they weren't a volunteer for something. So I want to point that out because what Mrs. Kana said, Ms. Kana said was, or excuse me, when Brennan responded to her letter, the letter was very favorable, very favorable to her demands, which would be very adverse to those people who this would represent a crackdown on. Now, what about the due process rights of those people who had their work product purged without even a hearing, without even the ability to show whether their, their product met professional standards based on facts and evidentiary value? Because here's what Brennan said. Your letter requests that the White House immediately create an interagency task force to address this problem. Last November, and tasked the Department of Homeland Security to form an interagency working group on training, on training. The first point they pointed out is a CVE, a Combating Violent Extremism Training Guideline and Best Practices paper was issued and that they were going to have to perform, that lined out the guidelines. It went on to say that they were going to build a, a rigorous CVE curriculum standard. It said, Collecting all, they were going to collect all training material that contains cultural or religious content, including information related to Islam or Muslims, and to establish a process, use professional standards, and adhere to core values and constitutional standards. Well, they basically said they were going to purge everything that had anything to do with Islam at the demand of the Muslim Brotherhood. As for professionalism, if you're telling me I, act, I acted unprofessional, please tell me how. But facts that are relevant should never be purged. And I shouldn't especially be purged by a group who our own Justice Department identified as unindicted co-conspirators. So I'd just like to point that out because it's very important. Why? Because we already saw that there's already stories coming out that the FBI did have knowledge of, this, of one of the two bombers uh, uh, at the Boston Marathon. They did know who they were, or they had reason to know. At least one country, I'm told Russia, and I've heard maybe another country, were t tipping off to us that these guys might be bad, and our, our Congressman Rogers on an oversight committee gave them a, give, gave them, absolved them of everything. Until you realize that if this happened, this happened about the time this purging of information happened. The people who were briefing on the possibility of Islamic-based terrorism were purged, and the documents were purged. So you see, it is entirely possible that the FBI who detained this man, because they weren't allowed to use any language about Islam, could never have under come to understand that they were doing it in the cause of Allah, even if they were wrong. So they couldn't have gotten to the terrorism, the motivations that drove their terrorism. So the FBI, we're in a situation right now where the FBI's requirements are that they can clear somebody for, from any interview because they're not allowed to use the language that would identify them as the terrorist that already killed people in Boston, that already killed people at Fort Hood, okay? That got people killed with Malvo, although I'm not going to hang that too hard on people. So what am I trying to say here? Because I'm, I'm working around trying to make a point. The point is, that even if those FBI agents did know the question to ask, they know that the Muslim Brotherhood demanded our White House punish people for asking the question. That's where we are right now. And what I can't understand is why a chairman of an oversight committee in the, in, in the other party gave the FBI a free ride here. Because if this standard stays, we already know that, that Al-Qaeda wants individual jihad. And there's every reason to believe that they've been working on it for three years to build up that capacity that it's coming. So I think that if this is the standard we're going to use with the FBI and DHS to identify domestic terrorists who are jihadis, you better start getting prepared. You start, we need to get prepared for the fact that they will systematically clear people who otherwise would be known to be clearly dangerous ahead of the game. How do we know that? Even the Russians told us these guys were bad, and we are looking at what information was there, and they clearly were, and they weren't allowed to make an assessment based on it. They weren't even allowed to ask the question. So with that, what I'd like to do is conclude this discussion. What we did was we talked about the fact that we have the media and elite law enforcement, intelligence, 
and strategic thinkers, national security people, talking about domestic terrorism. They're talking about lone wolves. They're talking about conspiracies that exist in a RICO manner. They're talking about everything they can possibly talk about so they don't have to talk about the fact that this could have been a lone wolf, that we saw on the ground activities that should have cued anybody who had indicators up, that there was the overwhelming probability that it was Al-Qaeda, and nothing happened. And we're still talking about that. So at what point does the need to fulfill an ideological desire to have every ma act of mass murder be a right-wing extremist become something that's killing people? Okay? Am I saying we shouldn't target Ku Klux Klan or some extreme Nazi party thing? Absolutely. But only insofar as they actually constitute a threat. Here we have a clear and present danger. And here we have DHS setting up guidelines that keep us from even being able to go after them when foreign powers give us the lowdown. Thank you for your time.